هذا هو اليوم الذي صنعه الرب فلنفرح ولنتهلل به المسيح قام من بين الأموات ووطئ الموت بالموت ووهب الحياة للذين في القبور المسيح قام من بين الأموات ووطئ الموت بالموت ووهب الحياة للذين في القبور Christos on his tip, Necron, Thanaton, Thanaton, Batisas, Ketis, and Ethnimas, Isoif, Karisameno. Welcome back, everybody, to another special edition of uh, Big Bang Theory L's BTS vlog. That's right, we're going to do another uh, uh, single episode. Uh, we're not going to vlog throughout the day because we're going to dedicate the entire episode uh, to going further into the consequences of the DCMA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, and why it acts as censorship, and how it creates uh, a large chunk, or actually it affects a large chunk of U.S. foreign policy. Uh, and this is talked about the war in Iraq, this is talked about the war in Afghanistan, uh, about what's happening in Syria, about the Coptic uh, genocide in Egypt, uh, the, Cop the Syrian uh, and Antiochian uh, uh, genocide in Syria. Uh, there are various number of genocides that, that, that the DCMA is actually profiting from. These people groups are, are, are involved with and are profiting from uh, the death of uh, these uh, uh, millions of people, actually. And so we're going to get into that uh, uh, further today. So, uh, how do I do? Let's, just, let's get started here. It is... Uh, oh, wait, wait. It's... Christos Anesti, Messiah Kham, and Christ is Risen. So our time and date stamp is now uh, 7 hours and 22 minutes into the day of uh, Friday, June 3rd, uh, 2016. Like any good discussion, uh, as you do your discussion, uh, as a researcher, you think about more things and, uh, and you go back and you want you do further research and then as you do your further research you take further notes and just remember here what you're seeing in the BTS log are called ad hoc notes these are the first primary notes taken while you're making an observation they are rough and unrefined this is where I make a lot of my mistakes this is where I make I fumble over words this is where uh, it's, it's not edited you see the rough edges that I have, you see, sometimes I need to, uh, I can't remember things. I've written it down, but I've, I can't remember it. And so I realize, okay, I have to go brush up on that area. If we're going to have a discussion and, and we're going to have a top uh, a, a discussion on a particular topic, then there are some areas that, you know, I realize as I'm listening to myself or as I go back and sort of watch this again, okay, I need to brush up on this area. I need to brush up on that area. I need to look more into this and I need, need to look more into that. This is the purpose of ad hoc notes. Uh, what this, uh, these special episodes do is they give you a more insight uh, into uh, another uh, uh, type of, uh, be, uh, another segment of uh, Big Bang Theory RL, and that's the InstaVlogs. InstaVlogs are a more, it's a half hour single topic, this is, so this is more or less like an InstaVlog right now. Rather than being vlogging throughout the day, this is like an InstaVlog where it's a single topic vlog. Uh, and... It's somewhat more organized than what this is. It's the sort of the next step. We, we, we go from ad hoc notes to insta vlogs. Insta vlogs are slightly more organized. They cover uh, a range of days in terms of uh, the amount of work you've done, uh, the information you've collected, and it sort of moves you along down the path towards uh, uh, a uh, documentary or uh, something along the lines of a published paper. Uh, my choice now is rather than doing published papers, I'd prefer to do a documentary and place the, uh, rather than have the, the documentary be like PBS or uh, Discovery, these are entertainment channels, the History Channel, these, the, all these documentaries are not real documentaries, they're, they're entertainment, a lot of information is left out. What I would like to do, and this is where I'm going with this, is this is more along the lines of a lecture. And this is what you're hearing now. You're hearing a, 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 a lecture off, based off my ad hoc notes, and that's why these are ad hoc notes it's, and in terms of behind the scenes, because uh, I'm doing this discussion, uh, this vlog, 
from my ad hoc notes. These are the first, the, the rough primary notes. And, this, and the, the, the date and time, actually, date and time stamp actually gives you an idea of how I progress, where I fall back, uh, where are the gaps, uh, different things like that. So you do have to, if, if you're interested in following along, it is not going to be um, entertaining in the sense that you have, uh, like on PBS and Discovery. PBS and Discovery, the amount of information in there is very elementary. It's your standard knowledge. It's uh, presented in a way that uh, they expect you to sort of fall within the sort of uh, standard or accepted knowledge of, of the world today. What we're doing here on, on Cyborg Alpha TV Network, in addition to some of the other programs that will be more entertaining, the, the scientific program, the educational program, this, which is, this is one of them, um, is here, and even, some, even, even the entertaining stuff will have an academic and research background to it. It's not going to simply be that, oh, we're having fun. Well, yeah, we are having fun. I mean, I, I enjoy this type, doing this type of research. This is kind of my fun. This is what makes me a nerd. Is I like doing this type of research. And this presents the research in a step-by-step -step form that you don't get anywhere else. You're not going to see this anywhere else. You're not going to see this level of information. You're not going to see how the information is put together. Usually when you're seeing a documentary on something that, that, that's been done that's amazing, you're not seeing the background notes. You're not seeing uh, the trials and tribulations that the person tries to get to this particular point. What you're seeing is the, you're seeing the final and finished product. Right? That's what you're seeing. And, and, every time, and even in the movies, when they have the serious work to be done, what do they do? They montage through it. They play some mu nice fast music or, they, or whatever appropriate music they're playing, and they skip through, uh, you know, frame by frame, you know, uh, this more serious, in-depth work that takes hours. And, well, hours, I shouldn't say hours. Um, it takes days and weeks. I mean, hours, yeah, when I, I spend here, I spend close to 12 hours a day studying here. Uh, so it's not something that uh, you can do right out of the box. You do have to work up to it. Um, the fatigue that produces, and then I talk about this in the, the fatigue that comes out of these vlogs, the, doing this type of studying, is enormous. And so sometimes that's reflected in here. It's, you know, I'm coming up here, I'm, I'm sitting in my place, it's 80 degrees. It's summertime, I don't have proper air conditioning in here. Uh... And so I'm, and I'm just getting out of bed, and I'm giving my thoughts and ideas. And so, of course, I'm going to look a wreck, you know. Uh, but at the same time, because I am spending here 12 hours, I'm not going to be in a suit and tie. I'm not going to be the prim and proper, the, the, or the I'm not going to be the uh, dressed-up anchor, the dressed-up doll, uh, giving a half-hour show. I'm giving you, particularly behind the scenes here, this is the raw research desk. Is it, I, the reason why it's comfortable like this is because I spent 12 hours here. I've done 12 hours in a standard work desk, you know, at a, you know, at a, a standard research desk with a proper chair and stuff like that, but couldn't do it. It, was, it. it really pushed the boundaries. This makes it a lot easier to do the 12 hours. So that, that's what this does here. So, um, and as it, Going into this, looking at this whole situation with uh, Kitty's mama, and Kitty's mama did... Uh, re uh, remove the uh, copyright block. Uh, Clintus TV, TV, I don't know whether he still knows about it. I haven't, I haven't checked yet. It depends. When I check the YouTube, it really depends on what I've done. It's, it's YouTube, uh, checking YouTube and the notifications on YouTube, particularly the uh, copyright notices, this is something that comes more in the middle of the day. So at the beginning of the day, and this is still the beginning of the day, uh, I got up around 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I haven't done all the checking yet I need to get done. The research comes first. And then all the, the other checking comes after. This. And so what happens is that yesterday I did the video, I did the, the, the discussion here, and then I went and checked to see what was going on, what, was, what had, had happened with the, uh, with the investigation. They, they said they had 30 days, they were going to do a 30-day review. Uh, and I went back and I said, okay, yeah, 30 days, 30 days. So I'll let them do what they need to get done and whatever they want to do. Uh, I'll go back and check it when everything is when my work is done. I'll go back and check during the day. And so I went back and checked, and uh, as I was pushing out the video, as I was pushing out the video to the internet, uh, it showed that uh, 
Katie's mama had indeed removed the uh, copyright block. So, so um, now it's good for that. Uh, Clintus TV, I don't know whether they still know about it or not. I, I didn't really file anything. I don't want to be too pushy with this because, again, there's a risk to the channel. If they're allowing you to do something, even though it flags a copyright, sort of a no-no type of thing, because it gives you a little mar uh, sort of a, a, a smudge on your record, um, you don't want to push it and say, okay, well, you know, I don't want to fight this right now because they're allowing it to go through. That it's not blocked anywhere. Uh, they're not doing anything, so let's leave it alone for now. Let's leave this issue alone for now. Let's deal with it in another way at another point in time. Uh, and that's kind of the approach I've taken to the whole thing with between uh, Clintus and uh, uh, and the copyright strike that I've gotten from them. And it's not because it's not really copyright strike. It's a it's a notice, and it's a bit of a smudge. But the thing is, if this thing problem continues, this is what I'm saying, I have, to, I have to address it now. If the problem continues, it could be it could be seriously damaging to the channel. And the thing is, the question is, am I being attacked by somebody in full in full screen? Am I being attacked by somebody at YouTube? I don't think I'm being attacked by Clintus, and he's just an average guy. I don't think he's coming out and attacking me. They're putting this mark on there. I don't these mama because they removed it were attacking me. I mean, it, it could look like that initially, but I don't know what they were thinking when they in terms of, in terms of blocking the entire video uh, for one uh, a minute twenty four. That revelation hasn't come to me yet. I don't honest, I don't know what they were thinking about this. Did they initially see it and say no, and then later on change their mind, or did YouTube automatically flag it and they didn't really know about it until I filed the claim? Uh, I mean, this is the thing. I don't know exactly how what the process was. I didn't know. I don't know what they knew at the time, and so this is how we end up here. Anyways, uh, we're going to come back in the next segment. There are going to be graphics after this uh, segment here in between each segment. So I'll see you in a few minutes. Right, we're back. Uh, so we're talking about uh, the views of Clintus TV and Kitty's mama. I don't. I said I don't know what they're thinking about these things or how they view these things. I haven't heard from them. Maybe I've I've sent them the videos. I've sort of, you know I sent them, but sort of let, notified them that I've have done the videos through Google Plus and and other means. Uh, I don't know what they think about the video, how they think about it, what their views are on this. Um, I'd like to hear from them uh, in the YouTube way, you know, put up a put up a response video or something like that uh, to say, well, this was the issue here. This is how I felt. Uh, I've maybe since changed my mind. Uh, you know, what's their policy? You know, what, how they do they view this? Uh, from my perspective, it has to do a lot with, and, and it, it began way back when uh, with the Universal Music Group, uh, and it was back in 2012. I was doing a documentary and I published a documentary on the dances of the Middle East. These, the, um, the Muslims don't dance. There is no dancing in Islam. Uh, it's not allowed. Music is not allowed. Alcohol is not allowed in Islam. And so when you see it, the music in the Middle East and you see the dancing in the Middle East, it comes from prior to Islam. In other words, there is a culture that was prior to Islam. This is the the culture of antiquities in that area. This includes the Coptics. This includes the uh, Antiochians. These are Syrians. The Coptics are Egypt are Egyptians. They're connected to uh, the ancient Egyptians. Uh, there are these cultures, these ancient cultures that existed back then. And what we're seeing in these dances that have come through through Islam through the music is you're seeing the ancient culture through the the barbaric what we call the barbaric lens uh, and the collapse of the the, the, the Roman Empire uh, and the collapse really began about 800 AD. This is where you have the barbarians coming in and sacking bits and pieces of of, of the uh, the uh, Roman Empire. They started attacking Egypt. They started attacking uh, Rome. Uh, you had a number of different groups. You had the Muslims coming in from one direction. 
you had the Vikings coming from in from another direction, you know, the Scandinavians coming from another direction, and then you had the Germans, the Germanic tribes, uh, coming from again coming uh, coming from, from from within Central Europe, uh, and it's it, it's these sort of barbarians who came in and sort of put themselves on top of uh, the ancient societies, and this is kind of the way things are. The Romans themselves, when they when they conquered. Uh, the Hellenic Empire, because it was the Hellenic Empire before the Roman Empire. Well, the, the Romans were barbarians, and what they did is they simply adopted the culture of, that was around, that they conquered, and while they call themselves Roman, they're really Greeks. And this is why, up until basically 1500 AD, the common language of antiquities in the Middle East, that area oh, that, that defined the Roman Empire, was Greek. It wasn't Latin. The common language was Greek because it, that had continued from the uh, uh, Hellenic Empire. And so when you go into this and you see this, and you go, okay, this is what happened in, in, in Roman history. Then you go in and see that the, that the the Germans went in and started conquering these things. This is the people armies that went in there. Well, these are pre-people armies that went in because then you eventually have uh, Emperor Charlemagne at 800 AD coming, uh, ascending to the throne of, of the uh, so-called Roman Empire. But if you look at the history, the Roman Empire had already fallen apart by that time. So there wasn't really a Roman Empire. This was a, a creation of the Germanic uh, Frankish king uh, called Charlemagne. And he ended up really destroying a large chunk of the church that was there. And he also destroyed the Roman Empire. And so this was sort of the beginning of the end. This was the barbarians coming in and sacking all these different places and carrying off all the art. And, of course, because uh, we're talking about the um, Byzantine Empire, uh, a lot of the people in the Byzantine Empire were literate. They could read and write. There wasn't a, the Dark Ages hadn't occurred in the Byzantine Empire. The what the the Dark Ages that we talk about are talking about the uh, you're talking about the European Dark Ages from 800 A.D. to just about um, I would say 1400 A.D. That's when things started to change, and this change was that as the, the Middle East was being sacked. The libraries came from the Middle East, it came from the ancient cultures, into Europe. This is what formed, uh, through, the, through the Crusaders, through the Nice Teutonic, into the Masonic Lodges, into the Illuminati. This is where, these are all their secret libraries. Because there were certain books that you couldn't have, there was certain knowledge, there was, there was secret knowledge that you couldn't have. And as these sort of list of banned books that the, that the papacy was burning, uh, and particularly when you get into the Inquisition, the, uh, 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 that period, we'll study that period and see what happened during the Inquisition, then you can understand why you have the formation of secret, secret societies based on libraries, not gold. People say, oh yeah, the, the, the Masonic societies, these secret societies, they formed because they were hiding money. No, they weren't hiding money. What, were they, what, was, the, what was their treasure that they were hiding? It was knowledge. It was forbidden knowledge. And here's the key. It is out of these groups, the Masonic groups, that you see it with George Washington, the Founding Fathers, Ben Franklin, all the Founding Fathers, you see them with their aprons. They're Masonic. And what was the Masonic issue? They had all the secret knowledge. And the knowledge at that time was forbidden. If you were found with this particular knowledge, you were found with these particular books, you would be executed. So we were simply sent to prison for this knowledge. This was illegal knowledge. They had... They had illegal knowledge. And this is why, this is the impetus for the First Amendment uh, when we talk about free speech, that you couldn't impose and say, hey, you cannot have that knowledge. This is the entire birth of free speech. And today we're tossing it away. But the thing is, there, again, there are ancient, there are ancient uh, consequences to this. And this is what we're talking about, what's happening in the Middle East. What's happening in the Middle East is a genocide. The Christians that are in the Middle East are not European. They're ancient. They're pre-European. They're pre-1008. They're pre-Charlemagne. They're pre the uh, invasion of the uh, barbarians. This, is included, this includes the Ar Arabs. The Arabs were not, not, were not, uh, the people of antiquity. They were not the intelligent people. 
they were the barbarians and they took over these areas and even Neil deGrasse Tyson who looked at the history of this started noticing from 800 AD on that a black cloud sat on the Middle East and destroyed all the ideas that were coming out, all the ideas of technology. Then he said, before, 700 AD, before 800 AD, the, 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 the Middle East was blooming. Mathematics, engineering, uh, science, everything was there. Then 800 AD and on, a black cloud blocks everything out. What is that black cloud? It's the Muslim invasion. It's Islam. And this is what's happening today. When you talk about the, what's going on today, the whole fear of Islam in the United States, the you call Islamic phobia, there's a good reason for it. There's history by the Islam, everywhere it shows up, destroys the culture that's there. It just literally wipes it out and you get a black cloud that's going on, that comes over, that sits on and oppresses the environment there. And this is what's going to this is what they're afraid of in Europe. This is what, when we talk about what, what's going on here, they're afraid of the refugees. Why? Because they see what's happening. They see that the European view of things is going to be blotted out as the, as the, as, as the Muslims come in as, as hordes, as barbarians, and wipe out the culture that's there. This is their history. This is not something that's brand new. This is the history of Islam. And the thing is that a lot of people don't understand this. They don't understand the history because the, the, the history is never taught in the, in, in the textbook. There's a good reason why for this, this, this is left out of textbooks. Why? Because if you actually knew ancient history, you would understand that the European Empire, the European view, is a complete fantasy. There is no Indo-European language. Because there was no Europe at the time India was around. Europe was not part of the ancient antiquity societies. England was. England was, was part of it because that's why you have St. Joseph of Arimathea who had took down Christ from the cross. He ended up uh, in England. This is why you have in England the search for the Holy Grail. Because that's where he ended up going. And this was, this was at zero, just around 0 AD. Right? In this span, time span between 0 AD and 100 AD this was the time of the Roman Empire uh, St. Joseph of Arimathea sailed from Jerusalem from the Middle East, from Palestine at that time, that was Palestine at the time, all the way to England. So England was on the ancient map. It was on the ancient Egyptian map. It was on the Hellenic map. It was on the Roman map. They knew about the, uh, England. But the thing is, no one went in. Went in there's no record of, of anyone going in to uh, Europe, into what's called Gaul. It was only the Roman Empire that had these sort of excursions into these places. Anyways, when we come back on the next session, we'll continue on with this discussion. And uh, see you then. Um, we're sure you the 10-minute segments on here, so uh, <laughs> you look at the clock, you hope you get your discussions properly. Anyway, as I said, what happens is that Europe was not known. Europe was really a barbaric society. And this is where you had the Dark Ages. And, but Europe, when it, when it became a sort of a state, wanted to create a mythology that put itself at the center of of everything in the world. And so this is what you're seeing today with uh, the Eurozone and the Euro song and everything like that. You're seeing the creation of a European fantasy, a European mythology 
of how ancient Europe was. And the thing is, the Nazis did the same thing. The Nazis were in, 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 in the same mind, mindset. This is why the, the Nazis had as their symbols, as their ideology, Sumerian ideology. They, were, they, they considered themselves to be Sumerian. They considered themselves to be ancient Babylonians. And they connected to the ether because these, the, these books, these ancient books, came up to them through through a variety of different secret societies into the Nazi part. The SS were part of this sort of cult, a sort of a Masonic cult that had all these different books from the Middle East uh, that they had from from the Crusades. And they needed a sort of called so called re-engineer society to create the next what they believe to be the next evolution. And in their creation of, of an engineering society, they ended up going back to something that, that, that was created by a Jew, of all things. Uh, you know, if you want to you know, look at how the, these, the Nazis viewed um, Jews, just go back and see what they did to the Jews. You know? And, and, and then you can understand uh, why this is such a contradiction here is because the whole foundation for what they did was not Germanic. The Germans didn't develop the uh, concentration camps. The concentration camps and a lot of these sort of called the re-education camps came out of uh, uh, Marx, Freud, and uh, another, a person named Edward Bernays, who was, was Freud's nephew. And it was a concept that uh, m humankind, the masses of humankind, are basically like animals, and they need to be herded into particular directions. And then they, call, they actually called the bewildered herd. The, the psychologists and the people who design society, the sociologists, right? And these we're talking about the people who actually have the power, not the sociologists in the, uh, in, in the university, but the people who have the power, they're sociologists. These are people who are engineering society. This is what you hear Obama, Obama talking about the engineers. They talk about progress. Anyone who's on the democratic side think, who are, are progressives talk about the engineering of, of society. But the thing is, this, uh, this engineering has two points to it. One is genetic. The genetic view of uh, engineering society believes that all of our traits come from our genes. And this is why you had people talking about, uh, when they first came up, they were uh, talking about homosexuality as being genetic, as a biological trait. Right? And later on, once that was accepted, you had the transgender coming up and saying, no, uh, uh, homosexuality is not uh, biological because gender is conceptual. It's about the soul, right? Two soul, two you know, twin souls. You know, one male, one female, uh, and each ba one battling. They, they're each battling for uh, a dominance. One you know, with, with, with depends on who wins out, right? Or, or a wrong soul in the wrong body, right? Uh, and this is again a conceptual thing. And these two sides exist side by side. The communists on the left were socialists. They, they, they viewed the uh, in terms of how things were. They viewed that society changed how people behaved, and they can hurt them in terms of controlling their behavior. The the people on the right, the socialists on the right, the Nazis, the national, the nationalists. These were the patriots, and they were they, they were nationalists. The whole thing was about patriotic the patriotism. And this is why American patriotism is so the way it is, is because it was formed by Nazis. The American patriotism is basically a Nazi ideology. Because it's about the nation first. It's not about freedom. It's about the nation first. And it's my nation, right or wrong, and this is the whole push for it. And their belief is genetics. That you have to engineer the gen. These are the people who are doing GMO. This is the whole thing behind genetic engineering. About genetic engineering of animals. Genetic engineering of human beings. This is part of the Nazi uh, understanding of things. So when they put people into concentration camps... They weren't going, oh, yeah, these people, they're bad people here. Uh, let's simply get rid of them. They couldn't do that. They had a, because it wasn't just Hitler that needed this. They created an entire bureaucracy, and they trained the bureaucracy. They got all of German society to believe that killing people who had defects, these are called defective people. And this is why I go, look, go and look up the term morons and, and idiots. These are the terms, for, the terms for defective people who were sterilized in the United States and around the world. Look at the, the, the look at sterile, go into the history of sterilization into, into uh, defective people. Right? There's a history to this in the 1930s and the 1940s. This led 
to the camps like Auschwitz. And they put these people in there and say, okay, we're going to work them as, to as much as they possible as they can, and then when they know it can no longer work, we're going to kill them. Because why? Because you cannot correct genes. You are either born with them or you're not born with them. And this produced Auschwitz. And the thing is, is that because it's today, well, we're not supposed to bet, we're not supposed to uh, profit from Auschwitz. I mean, it would be unthinkable for anyone to go up there and say, "Okay, I'm going to profit from, from Auschwitz, from the death of the uh, of the Holocaust, and be okay." No one would think like that. But in Ger Germany at the time, they did because the the whole society was brainwashed. It was tr trained. It was herded into a psychopathic society where they saw these things happening but thought it was okay. They didn't understand anymore that the murder of these people was, was wrong. This is what they call euthanasia. Euthanasia means is a Greek word for happy death. They thought these people, oh, they're, they're, they're happy. They're, they're dying happy. And there's no problem here. But there is a problem. Because these people weren't dying happy. And this this whole concept of people as animals, people as, as chemicals, uh, it's all falling apart. These were theories. And they were applying these things. They said, okay, it's acceptable to kill people based on your belief. This is what we see in Islam today. But Islam is not, is, this whole concept of killing people for your belief is not exclusive to Islam. Socialism has this on both the left and the right. And you can go into the socialist history on the left and the right and see millions of people dead in the wake of their society. And this is what's happening in Venezuela. And the thing is, because they view these people as animals, and there's no soul there, it doesn't matter. And this is why what, what happens to us, and we're talking about the, so the, the Coptic uh, genocide, the, uh, the, 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 and the Syrian genocide, the ancient Christians there, that is occurring today in the Middle, in the Middle East. Our American policy is involved in this. We're creating these, these problems. Why? Because Obama stood up and said, this is the, the, the Muslim world. The thing is, the Muslim world didn't exist like that. The Muslim world only exists because it created genocide. It killed all the people who refused to become Muslims. And we should be, we should be concerned about this because we're following down the same path of the psychopathic society where these ideals that kill people and create totalitarian like the copyright law. This should bother a lot. It should bother a lot more people. This should be a massive issue. The fact that it is not a massive issue means that our society today, the American society, today, the people who view a free society have become psychopathic. We're going down that same path that led to Auschwitz. Auschwitz the history of Auschwitz is repeating itself. But this time, it's repeating itself in the United States. And this is something we should be concerned about. Because if that happens, if we become acceptant of these totalitarian ideas, then our freedom is gone and we, there is no winning this war because our minds would have been taken over, our hearts would have been now totalitarian, and we will not have our freedom once again. We'll lose it this time. We will not win this war if we don't wake up now and say, hey, these things matter. Democratic